All right, we're back. This is PBS Book View Now. We're at AWP 2016, and I'm sitting with Amber Tamblin, poet, actress, uh, and most recently of Dark Sparkler, a yes. collection of poems, which has a, an incredible cover. Thank you. Um, yeah. We talked a little bit off camera about some of the artwork inside. We'll talk about your poems too, but there's a really beautiful combination of artwork uh, and, and beautiful paintings and graphics and your poems. When you envisioned this book originally, this collection, did you think about the sort of media aspects and how you wanted to present it? Were you involved in all aspects of that? Yeah, definitely. I think um, you know the artwork that's inside uh, actually made the selling of the book a lot more difficult. <laughs> it was really complicated, I think, because a lot of publishers looked at it and were like, this is extraordinary it, poems, but is it an art book? Is it a poetry book? And I had sort of always envisioned it as a combination of the two. Um, and uh, it originally started with Marilyn Manson's piece that's in there. He mm -hmm. did a, um, a portrait of Sharon Tate that's in the book. And uh, it was so inspiring to me. And he was inspired by the poem. And I thought, how great it would be to have uh, some really wonderful male artists interpreting um, the poetry about young female actresses who died. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's sort of how it started. And I created a whole layout and, and sort of lookbook uh, for presentation mm -hmm. when I was sort of selling the book. Yeah, so I, I read that the, the book started with Brittany Murphy. You mentioned yes. that it's a, a collection of, of stories about actresses in Hollywood who came to an untimely demise of some sort, or died, or it's in some cases tragically, in some cases mysteriously. It started with Brittany Murphy, and that led you into this research project that became this study of the sort of dark underbelly of yeah. Hollywood, especially as it pertains to women. Yeah, I mean, you know, Brittany was, you know, when I was born here, I was born in Los Angeles, born and raised here. I'm a third generation from Los Angeles. My grandfather was born here, like, I've been here a long time. I have a very different relationship with the city, I think, than a lot of um, actresses do that come here, that move here primarily to become famous or to do that particular job, which can be so um, exhausting for women and also painful, in particular to women. And so Brittany was a contemporary of mine, and uh, you know, we went on the same auditions and sort of grew up in the business together around the same time. And uh, so when she died in such a sort of bizarre way uh, in which no one was really publicly talking about her death but also wasn't really talking about how she died and uh, the fact that she had been on a lot of pills and was you know very very sick had pneumonia had all this stuff um, and they just sort of like immortalized her as this beautiful thing and no one wanted to talk about the bad stuff um, and I sort of became obsessed with the bad stuff and 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 looking looking at that and, and really talking about the bad stuff which I feel like you know you and I are sitting down we're having this wonderful conversation that's otherwise pretty intimate but for the most part actresses are really trained and taught to not to not really reveal and to not talk about the dark stuff or the bad stuff and um, that's just out of pure protection you mm -hmm. know because things can be taken out of context and quotes and interviews and things like that and you learn to protect yourself. Um, and so I really wanted to write a book in which, you know, these women were exposed in a good way, that you sort of understood the vulnerability that was um, deep inside of them and sort of the, the, you know, the lack of having any connection between the real world made them feel isolated. And, and you know, as opposed to saying, oh, these women are so, uh, you know, what a sad life that they led. and. Um, of privilege, which they did, and all of those things, but to really sort of humanize them in their pain. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating in the sense that this is a life that so many young people chase, yes, want, yeah. And yet, when you read your book, it it strikes me as um, obviously there's a danger to achieving yeah. what you want, or getting close to it, or flying close to the sun, yeah. as it were. I mean, there's stories in here about people that I knew, because I grew up in the 70s, like Dana Plato or yeah. Dominique Dunn. Or Dana's one of the saddest ones in the book, too. And by the way, probably, I think, the hardest. From the facts uh, of life. Yeah. Uh, people who don't know. Um, uh, actually, she was different strokes. Oh, different strokes. Yes. So sorry, you're but right. But she, that was How the most I, tragic one. I am, one. like, so pop culture, and I messed that That's up. That's okay. I'll, I'll never live it down. That's okay. Um, yeah. Yeah, but she was one of the hardest ones to write, just because of the type of her demise. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, they're, they're, they're quite... They're quite haunt. Their stories were quite haunting to yeah. me in the five years it took to research it, and, um, and and unbelievable some of the connections that I found that you see in the book yeah. uh, between the women. Not even knowing that some of them, you know, their stage names were inspired by actresses that died 
exactly like how they ended up dying. Right. And, and, and that doesn't mean like a drug overdose. That means like suicide in a very particular way. And they didn't even realize that. I mean, it was pretty. It was a pretty wild journey to research the whole thing. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's, we talked about some 80 stars, but there's also people like Jane Mansfield in the book yeah. and, and a woman named Peg Entwistle that I knew nothing about. Yeah. There's, this is the kind of book where you... You, you read it, and then you don't necessarily know who they are, and then you go Google, and then yeah. you find out more. And yeah. Peg Entwistle is this woman in the 20s, I believe, who jumped yeah. off the H on the Hollywood sign. That's right. And they found her, and you write a, a, a really haunting poem about her and the yeah. shoes that they found. Yeah, the perspective of her shoes sort of talking her into walking up the hill. Yeah. Um, you know, she was one of those films that didn't make it from silent films to talkies yeah. uh, during that time. And I would say she was probably... As, as famous at that point as like a Brie Larson or something. Right. Um, like really up and coming and a great actress and then they ever, America heard her voice and they're like, nah, never mind. Yeah. So, you know, it's heartbreaking. It's the, the business that I'm in, the only other people that can understand a business that's based on looks, almost, almost primarily looks alone. Your yeah. face, your body, your voice, the sound of it. Uh, is exactly this, is exactly Hollywood. The other thing is modeling, you know? Those are those are the sort of two uh, places in which that is the only place, that, the only thing that really, really matters, which mm -hmm. is so painful in a lot yeah. of ways if you consider it, because at least musicians have music, and it doesn't really have to do with their body. Um, artists have paintings or, you know, and whatever, whatever else, other artistic medium like that. But actors, like, you can be an extraordinary actor, but if your body doesn't look in a certain way, especially for a woman, yeah. you're done. Yeah. Uh, which is well, the heartbreaking thing about this. Is right. Some of these women were just extraordinary actresses, and they couldn't get past, nor could Hollywood get past, the way that they ended up looking or started behaving, and it, it destroyed them. Yeah. I, I'm fascinated with the notion of sort of celebrityism, if that's a word. Yeah, um, The idea <laughs> of living in a world where you are constantly object objectified, uh, and yet uh, you know, always seeking and searching to be an artist and to yeah. be to be treated seriously, or to be treated like a human being. You know, yeah. like that. But yet you're on the other side of the wall where mm -hmm. it, it comes with some so many negatives to it. And yet sometimes it's hard to get people who feel sorry for that. I mean, because they feel like you're living the dream. Well, I think that that's a you know, I think that's a reality. Like if you know, even on my social media, right? Like there's a great example. Anytime I see an actress. Um, you know, like my, fr I'll give an example of my friend America Ferreira. Um, uh, if you speak out politically or you speak out about a new project you're doing or whatever those things may be, there's always this, um, this attitude of like, I don't want to hear anything from a rich Hollywood actress. Um, rich is really funny because I think there's like 1% of actors that are rich in the entire business. I mean, the Screen Actors Guild statistically 5% of actors in the Screen Actors Guild works to work consistently. Right. Everybody else is unemployed all the time. Yeah. You are lucky as an actor if you get one job a year, maybe two, and then everything else is like small, itty bitty things. And, and those two jobs you probably don't even really get paid for unless you're in that top tier. Mm -hmm. But there's this attitude towards actors like there's like, you know, that everybody who is an actor is you know, Cate Blanchett. That yeah. they're, everybody must be that famous and happy and beautiful and wealthy. I don't know if she's wealthy. I'm not putting that on her. But, you know, the idea that everyone is like that. Right. Well, on the other side, you have your other foot in the poetry world where yeah. everyone's perceived, the, 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 the uh, perception of a poet is that you're, that you have nothing, <laughs> that you're living on, you know, you're a pauper. Um, right. And so you have I'm both of those. I'm somewhere in the middle. Yeah, you really are. You're sort of straddling that. Tell me what it's meant to you as an artist. To, to, to be in two different mediums that are so different. And on one hand, a poet, you rarely know what a poet looks like. Um, yeah, that's true. The best you do, like Ada Limon, who'll be here earlier, I mean, you see them. But many times you don't. Yeah. What is it like to be in those two worlds simultaneously? Well, I've been writing poetry. This is my third collection. I've been writing it, and most people don't know that about me, that I've been writing since I was 12 years old. Um, I put out a bunch of chapbooks in my teenage years, and my first book was published when I was 21. I mean, it's, it's I grew up around poets. Poetry is endemic to my life in the way that acting is. Uh, it's it's very much a part of who I am, and it always has been, and it always will be. Um, and I think it's just such a wonderful. For me, I can say, it's been a cathartic medium throughout my experience. Like growing up on a soap opera, I was on a soap opera from 11 to 17, and General Hospital. Yeah, General Hospital, and being able to just write about 
not even at that age knowing what objectification was, not even knowing what what I was it what I meant to the world or what I meant to the country and uh, and the ownership that I was sort of giving people over my own body and the way in which that I looked um, and to be able to like write about that at, during that young age I think was so important to this work to this eventually happening um, to be able to say to share that experience in a really honest way again outside of like a magazine interview or something like that right. um, to really be intimate about the pain, mm -hmm. even from a teenage years and all, all the way up into my 20s and now 32 and, and with this, uh, you know, which is so much different. And I've always said acting is like f only 50% yours. You go in, you do your job, you give everything that you have, and then a million things could go wrong. Yeah. You know, the movie could not be great. It could never get distribution. It could get distribution and no one can ever see it. I mean, it's like so out of your hands. Uh, you know, and writing really belong, like poetry really belongs to me. The stories, the way that I want people to feel and the way that I've wanted them to feel when I'm acting, mm -hmm. like the things I've wanted to give them and share um, emotionally, I can do with poetry. I have control over that. And I, uh, that's one of the great things about, you know, the work for me is that it is an actual like direct, uh, complete direct conduit to acting for people who love my acting in a way that they would have never expected. So normally they're used to being so affected uh, by me from my work, from the acting work, but now there's like young women who are like, you know, I've, I've had so many people come up to me and especially young women to say how much like Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, favorite movie, they love that movie. And I poured my guts into that film, and it's one of the things I'm very proud Fine of in my career. Fine book as well. Yeah. Fine book yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, wonderfully adapted. Um, and uh, now it's just so also so wonderful for them to say the same thing about Dark Sparkler. Right. And for that to really be impactful and to tell me stories about, you know, wanting to get into the business or being here and acting for years and not having it happen and then, like, questioning everything about their lives and, you know, getting plastic surgery to try to get jobs... And so I'm actually still connecting with them, but in this totally different way than I ever did because right. with acting, it's a one-way mirror. Right. I affect them, but I'm never affected by them. I don't feel anything that they feel, you see. And now with this, it's like a, it's like a total, complete communication that right. I, that, that's so wonderful and special to me. And yeah. I think that's you know, the, the real gift of, of what literature can do. Yeah, well, poetry will keep you sane. Yes, poetry will and, keep you sane. And it allows us to see another side of you, but also yeah. your research, which yeah. is obviously in depth. Um, in fact, your epilogue at the end is incredible with the suggestions about what to Google. Yeah. Um, I did take you up on a few of those. It's <laughs> really great work. This, this book will endure. We can't wait to see what you do next. Thank you so much, yeah. And always be watching for what you're going to do on your acting front, too. So. Oh, there's got stuff coming up on both sides, writing and acting, so right. you'll hear all about it. I'm well, you're sure very soon busy. enough. Yeah. Thank you so much for being Thank here, Amber. Thank you so Amber. much for having me.